Hello, my name is Lauren Aragoni, and I'm a nurse practitioner for the Pediatric Long-Term Outcome Study at Children's National. Today, I'm presenting my DMP project uh, through UPenn, which is a webinar to improve parental COVID vaccine hesitancy. At the time of this presentation, there have been over 5 million deaths from COVID worldwide, and children consist of about 14% of those cases uh, and COVID has caused 738 pediatric deaths. COVID vaccines have been developed at record speed using mRNA technology with hopes to return the world back to its prior state. The World Health Organization defines vaccine hesitancy as a delay in acceptance or refusal of vaccines despite availability of the vaccine. And this is not a new public health phenomenon. In a 2021 national survey, 54% of parents reported being hesitant to vaccinate their child against COVID. And with many parents and caregivers turning to the web to find answers to vaccine questions, there is a role for digital interventions to halt the spread of misinformation and improve parental vaccine hesitancy with science-based evidence. Given the presence of misinformation available on the internet, the question this project seeks to address is, does providing education to parents via a single one hour webinar affect parental COVID vaccine hesitancy? Several digital interventions have been studied in the last decade to improve parental vaccine hesitancy and the evidence supports digital interventions can improve vaccination rates and intention to vaccinate. Ultimately, a webinar was chosen for this project due to its feasibility and short timeline of the DNP project while still providing needed education to parents digitally. The webinar lasted for one hour and had three medical experts from the Children's National Community, including a physician leading the Pfizer COVID vaccine trials at Children's, uh, the COVID vaccine medical director at Children's, and an infectious disease physician with an interest in vaccine hesitancy. The webinar was advertised through Children's National social media pages. Uh, and it took place on March 16, 2022. Over 70 people registered for the live webinar and we did have 30 live viewers. Uh, we did receive a lower than expected number of return survey responses for the live webinar, uh, but we are posting the webinar this week to YouTube on the Children's National YouTube page uh, for four weeks to gather additional data and views and survey responses. The primary outcome of this project is vaccine hesitancy as measured by an adapted parental attitudes of childhood vaccine survey. This was developed about 10 years ago out of Seattle Children's Hospital uh, by Dr. Opal. And the PACV is a previously validated tool used commonly in childhood vaccine hesitancy research. The PACV was minorly changed to include questions regarding the COVID vaccine rather than general, general childhood vaccines. Um, for example, the question, do you intend to give your child the COVID vaccine when it becomes available to their age group was added to the survey. Though a direct measure of vaccination rates is not possible for this project due to its time constraints for the curriculum, um, the hope is that parents will feel empowered and formed to make a decision to vaccinate their child. With more children vaccinated against COVID, herd immunity can be achieved and what we are learning here now about COVID-19 information dissemination can be applied to future pandemics and public health concerns. We have learned how to rapidly collect, develop, and disseminate disease information during the pandemic. And current available research supports that digital interventions can improve parental vaccine hesitancy. Vaccine outreach can begin even before the vaccine is available. Applying these learned lessons can lead to more vaccinated individuals and is an important step in battling parental vaccine hesitancy now and for future pandemic and viruses. Thank you so much. Okay, this is take two. Today, we're here to talk about parent education, a key component to the success of antigrade flushes via Malone appendicostomy for the treatment of fecal incontinence and functional constipation. A 
Malonic pentecostomy provides access to the colon for anti-grade flushes that we use to treat fecal incontinence and constipation. However, we realize that the surgical intervention of providing access is just one component of success. Additionally, key components include multimodal methods and education to caregivers that incorporate visual, auditory, written, and kinesthetic components. A tiered approach across a continuum of time allows these components to be delivered to the family in stages to provide them the education they need to be fully engaged in caring for their child. It allows them to possess the knowledge, the skills, and the attitudes they need when they're caring for their child. We accomplish this across a continuum of time, including four touch points. The first being at the first clinic visit, either in person or via Zoom, when a caregiver was first introduced to antigrade flushes through him alone. The nurse utilizes illustrations and documents that are written at a fifth grade literacy level. Shortly after the clinic visit, a nursing team member would call the family and discuss Malone access options, the clinical and financial considerations to both self-catheterization or placement of an indwelling balloon device were discussed. Postoperatively, a nursing team member visits the family at the bedside and provides education including tactile learning and practice with the equipment. And finally, four to six weeks postoperatively, a clinic visit allowed caregivers to demonstrate their understanding of all the education they had been provided. Our study involved 30 patients over April to August of 2021. Of those 30 patients, nine patients elected to self-catheterize their malone appendicostomy daily. 20 elected to have an indwelling balloon device placed, and one received a chait tube. We hope to avoid problems that parents have previously experienced, including the inability to recognize signs of a surgical site infection, inadequate cleaning or care of the Malone site, their inability to catheterize successfully, difficulty flushing or preventing clogged tubing, dislodgement of the indwelling device, or just completely inability, the inability to utilize the indwelling device. Of our 30 patients, the nine who elected to self-catheterize daily had no complications related to education. The 20 patients who received an indwelling balloon device also had no complications. Our chait tube patient did have a complication that we believe could have been avoided had the parents had uh, received more education or better education in avoiding any complications. We concluded that a staged approach to multimodal education provided the knowledge, the skills, and the attitudes necessary for care parents to provide competent care after a Malone appendicostomy. We're currently studying the retention and application of this educational process and its impact on outcomes for other surgical procedures. Thank you. I would just like to say in gratitude and recognition of our colorectal nurses, Justine Gang Gagnon and Megan Mesa, who continually work on these education documents to provide our families with the best possible outcomes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Dr. Lisa Faniel. I'm a clinical social worker in the Division of Hematology at Children's National Hospital. The title of my abstract is Social Determinants of Health and Their Impact on Families of Children with Sickle Cell Disease. The members of my abstract team include Dr. Spella Brown, Stephanie Margulies, Brenda Martin, Dr. Martin, Christina Augustin, Dr. Sims, Susan Harvey, Dr. Webb, Dr. Wolford, Dr. Hardy, Dr. Majundar, Dr. Dabari, and Dr. Campbell. Social experiences are known to impact health outcomes in the general pediatric population. These experiences can be examined through the construct of social determinants of health. Social determinants of health are the condition in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age. Examples of social determinants of health include housing, food security, employment and educational attainment, and healthcare access. 
Sickle cell disease is a chronic illness that affects approximately 100,000 people in the United States, primarily of African descent. Many social, political, and economic policies in the United States have had a profound impact on the health of marginalized populations, including those with sickle cell disease. However, few studies have examined their impact through the construct of social determinants of health in youth with sickle cell disease. The purpose of the study was to determine the magnitude of social determinants of health on families of children with sickle cell disease. Caregivers of children with sickle cell disease were recruited for the study during clinic visits and hospitalizations between October 2021 and February 2022. Caregivers completed a one-time 30-question survey about social determinants of health that included the USDA food security scale and the We Care housing screening tool in REDCap. Parents were allowed to skip questions during the survey. The survey took approximately 20 minutes to complete. Upon completion of the study, each caregiver received a $25 gift card. All methods and procedures were approved by the Children's National Hospital Institutional Review Board. Descriptive statistics were used to generate frequencies and percentages for categorical variables in the collected sample. 99 caregivers of children with sickle cell disease completed the survey. 98% of respondents were female. 98% were Black or African American. 61% of respondents were born in the United States. 29% of respondents graduated from college and 17.5% were unemployed. 66% of respondents had Medicaid and 33% had commercial insurance. 26% endorsed food insecurity and 27% relied on low cost food. 31% lived in an apartment, 67.7% lived in a house, and 1% lived in a shelter or transitional housing. 16% lived in subsidized or public housing, 37% reported being unable to pay the mortgage or rent on time at least once. 9% reported living with other people because of financial difficulties. 5% reported their home not being heated, and 7% reported being evicted from their home. Social determinants of health have a major impact on patients' health and quality of life. Addressing health disparities in marginalized groups can be challenging, but it is essential. Our findings demonstrate high rates of food and housing insecurities among patients with sickle cell disease and their families. Future research is needed to determine the impact of social determinants of health on high-risk populations, such as those with sickle cell disease, and to determine how these factors impact health outcomes. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Pam Hines and I'm a nurse and a nurse scientist here at Children's National Hospital. And I'm really excited by your interest in learning more about this study, Profiles of Symptom, Suffering and Functioning in Children and Adolescents Receiving Chemotherapy. I'm quite excited to be able to honor all of my colleagues from very different disciplines and different parts of the world who helped to complete this particular study. I would like to share with you that we have noted almost intuitively that some children, some adolescents who are receiving chemotherapy for cancer report having very few symptom related adverse events, but others experience having multiple serious symptom-related adverse events and suffering. Our thinking was that if we could identify those children and adolescents early in their treatment who are most likely to have pronounced symptom suffering, we might be able to tailor their supportive care so that we could reduce their symptom burdens. So therefore, our purpose with this study was to identify, are there symptom profiles in children and adolescents before and after chemotherapy? 
And are there any personal or treatment factors that might help to predict if such profiles existed? Across our nine sites, we had 436 patients, seven to 18 years of age, who completed six of the PROMISE pediatric measures. And the topics that we measured were pain interference, anxiety, depressive symptoms, fatigue, stress, and mobility. We use some very sophisticated statistical techniques in order to identify did symptom profiles exist? And if so, were there any other variables that might be associated with the profiles? And here are our results. We learned that in fact, there are three symptom profiles that we labeled high, medium, and low symptom suffering. And the same profiles emerged at both time points before chemotherapy and one to two weeks after chemotherapy. Quite important to us, the high symptom suffering profile had the fewest patients at both time points and low symptom suffering had the most at both time points. Important to us because such a small percentage, 16 to 20% at both time points in the high symptom suffering profile means that we're more likely to be able to have the resources to adequately respond to those in the high symptom suffering profile. Our results also indicated that almost 60% of patients remained in the very same profile at both time points. So if you began in the high symptom suffering profile, you were likely to remain in the high symptom suffering profile. The one profile that did enlarge itself is the low symptom suffering profile. So this means then that in fact, not all children and patients have the same symptom experience while receiving chemotherapy. And it does mean that we as clinicians have an opportunity to identify who is in which profile and then to take action to prevent or diminish symptom suffering. I thank you very much for your interest. All my best. Hello everyone, greetings from Washington, D.C. My name is Jessica Tompkins and I am a PhD student and research nurse from Children's National Hospital. We know you're very busy, so here's a brief glance of how you can support and connect with your patients and families during a cancer diagnosis. We'll discuss why our approach to pediatric advanced care planning helped families feel they were better caregivers to their adolescents with cancer. The title of this manuscript was Pediatric Advanced Care Planning and Families Positive Caregiving Appraisals in RCT. I would like to take this time to acknowledge all of the co-authors' contributions to this work as we could not have achieved this body of research without each of them. Little is known about how families respond to pediatric advanced care planning. Physicians are concerned that initiating these conversations with families can be too distressing for the families. This study aims to examine the effect of the FACE TC advanced care planning intervention on families appraisals of caregiving, distress and strain. This randomized clinical trial with adolescents and young adults with cancer and their families was conducted from July of 2016 to April of 2019 in four tertiary pediatric hospitals. Adolescents and young adults, family dyads, were randomized at a two to one intervention control ratio to either the three weekly sessions of the face tc intervention which included the lion advanced care planning survey next steps respecting choices conversation and completion of the five wishes or to the treatment as usual control group only the family portion of the diet was included in this study Generalized estimated equations assess the effect of intervention on families as measured by the family appraisal of caregiving questionnaire at three months post intervention. This trial had an N of 126 families with a mean family member age of 46 years old 
83% were female and 82% were white. Family TC, face TC families significantly increased positive caregiving appraisals at three months post-intervention when compared to control families. The beta of 0.35, 95% confidence interval range was 0.19 to 0.36 with a p-value of 0.03. A secondary analysis showed while the effect size was small, the results from the satisfaction questionnaire confirm positive outcomes for the face TC families who compared to control overwhelmingly reported the experience is worthwhile, useful, helpful, uh, and helpful even though strong feelings were elicited. Generalizability is limited by the participation rate of 39%, which is similar to dyadic end of life adult studies. Social desirability bias could have occurred with face-to-face -face administration of study questionnaires. However, this approach enabled monitoring of emotional reactions and control for issues of literacy, impaired vision, item comprehension, and questionnaire completeness. Compared to controls, families benefited from the participation in the face TC intervention, which resulted in positive appraisals of their caregiving for their child with cancer, while not significantly burdening them with distress or strain. Clinicians can be assured of the benefit and tolerability of this person-centered, family-supported model of advanced care planning. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day. My name is Emily DeRose, and on behalf of the Code Ears development team listed here, I would like to present a high-level summary of our QI initiative development and implementation of a novel emergency medical response process. Implemented in October of 2021, the Code Ears initiative reframed the medical emergency response resources at Children's National Hospital, Sheikh Zayed campus, and led to the development of two distinct targeted teams, separating inpatient Code Blue critical care response from all other outpatient, staff, and visitor emergencies. In the first four months of Code Ears implementation, there were 52 events. The patient types for these events were evenly divided between outpatient, staff, and visitors. The majority of patients were categorized as an ESI or Emergency Severity Index level one, indicating the highest level of acuity. The most common chief complaint was neurological, usually dizziness, syncope, or altered mental status. The majority of patients were transported to the emergency department and then eventually discharged home. Some were admitted or transferred to another facility. Code EARS is an emergent, time-focused response. The three control charts I would like to share with you today capture three different time metrics that we measure on every Code EARS response. This control chart displays the time from Code EARS alert page to the arrival of the team on scene of the event. The goal is five minutes or less. You'll see that the average time to scene was 3 minutes and 18 seconds, and 93% were less than or equal to 5 minutes. This chart displays the amount of time the Code EARS team spent on scene with the patient. The average time on scene is 4 minutes and 44 seconds. 76% of events met the goal of five minutes or less on scene. This chart displays the time from departing the scene of the event to arriving back in the emergency department with the patient. The average time is three minutes and 13 seconds. 91% of events met the goal of five minutes or less. 
Code Blue responses remain important for emergencies among registered inpatients at Children's National. Code Blue teams include many resources and are critical care based. Code EARS responses are a targeted emergency and BLS focused team that now address all emergencies in outpatient, staff, and visitors. The development and implementation of Code EARS has led to a successful reframing of a medical emergency resources, helping us better address all types of emergencies at the Children's National Main Campus. Thank you. Welcome to the RNCAST, The Mistake Room, leveraging gamification, technology, and simulation to prevent patient harm, enhance education, and elevate awareness around medication administration errors. In March 2021, error reporting data revealed a 20% increase in medication administration errors at Children's National. Knowing that nurses are the last point of contact before these errors reach the patient, we created the Medication Mistake Room to provide an interactive learning activity that focuses on preventing patient harm from incorrect medication administration at the bedside. Our team includes Raven McLeese, who is a nursing safety coordinator in the Department of Nursing Science Professional Practice and Quality. Her tenure at Children's began in 2009 on the surgical care unit as a floor nurse and later a shift coordinator. Her interest in safety and quality work in the Children's National Pathway to Nursing Care Excellence Fellowship led her to her current position. Raven's work focuses on data collection and project implementation related to providing safe nursing care. Laura Nicholson is a simulation education specialist in the simulation program at Children's National. Laura's simulation work includes the interprofessional in situ simulation program for nurses and residents on acute care and the first five minutes of a Code Blue program. Laura has several simulation based publications, including innovative hospital based pediatric virtual learning for nursing students and creation of a patient hospital escape room experience to reduce harm and improve quality of care. And Clarissa. Chan Salcedo is the informatics nurse in the Department of Nursing Systems. Clarissa has over 20 years of experience as a professional in the field of nursing informatics. Clarissa applies her nursing and informatics knowledge in the implementation and use of technology to assist nursing and clinical staff in providing quality and safe care. The Medication Administration Mistake Room is part of a two-component initiative focused on enhancing awareness and education regarding safe medication administration practices. The objectives of the initiative are to describe the importance of safe medication administration, identify elements of potential medication administration errors, and analyze and apply safety behaviors and practices. The two components include a didactic education module and the interactive mistake room. Our hope was to build upon the educational module by having participants to apply what they have learned in a hands-on interactive mistake room. We developed acute critical and ambulatory care simulations with eight to 10 medication administration errors in each patient scenario based on safety event reports, root cause analyses, and focus groups with frontline nurses and nurse educators. Simulation facilitators are provided with a toolkit and facilitator guidebook with step-by-step -step directions on how to set up and facilitate the mistake room. The simulation is based on the escape room concept. Nurses are required to go through the process of medication administration to include patient identification and actual barcode scanning of medications while identifying mistakes along the way. During the medication administration process, nurses will meet barriers in the form of common workflow distractions while finding hints and clues that will ultimately help them to escape the room. Our goal was to incorporate simulation, gamification, and the use of technology into an interactive experience that would allow participants the opportunity to apply and analyze safe practices and behaviors in a new and exciting way. So far, this initiative has been well received by frontline nurses and nursing leadership. To date, over 90% of nurses, that's almost 1,200 nurses, have completed the didactic component of this initiative. We are currently in phase two, which focused on the implementation of the mistake room. 
We successfully reached 100% of nursing staff on our pilot unit, and so far the mistake room has been completed by three of 16 nursing units with plans to reach 60% of all frontline nursing staff by June of 2022. We have also seen a decrease in incident reporting. Medication administration error incident reporting has decreased from an average of 27 errors per month to 21 errors per month since the implementation of this initiative. We hope you will stop by to see our poster, number 288, during Research, Education, and Innovation Week. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kelly Morsey. I am a PA in the Neurology Department at Children's National, and I am part of the Infantile Epilepsy Program within the Epilepsy Division. Our program coordinates care for patients diagnosed with infantile spasms. This is an age-specific type of epilepsy occurring in early infancy. It is one of the catastrophic childhood epilepsies due to the difficult to control seizures and association with neurodevelopmental regression. Our clinical team includes myself and Katie Havens, another physician assistant, Corinne Brandt, a family therapist, and Dr. Archana Passapaletti. Additional team members that contributed to this abstract include Dr. Tay Chang, Dr. Tammy Sashida, and Dr. William Gayard. Our program is also one of the clinics within the Comprehensive Pediatric Epilepsy Program that supports epilepsy patients across the pediatric lifespan. Current literature on health disparities show that minority groups experience higher rates of illness and death across a range of health conditions, including epilepsy. And there's currently little to no published data on racial and ethnic disparities for infantile spasms. We examined our cohort of infantile spasms patients for incidents, etiology, time to treatment, and treatment response to determine if there was a difference based on race and ethnicity. We looked at a prospective cohort of 49 consecutive infantile spasm referrals to our program between April 2019 and March 2021. Patients who received initial infantile spasms treatment outside of Children's National or had incomplete treatment course were excluded. Chi-square tests with p-value less than or equal to 0.05 were considered significant. We used the 2019 U.S. Census Bureau Racial and Ethnic Demography of the Greater D.C. Metropolitan Region for comparison. We found that the racial and ethnic demography of the 49 infants treated in our clinic was significantly different from what was expected of the population in the D.C. region. According to the 2019 U.S. Census Bureau, Greater D.C. is 45% white, 25% Black or African American, 16% Hispanic, and 10% Asian. Our co cohort was 39% Black or African American, 29% Hispanic, 27% White, and 6% Asian. This is more representative of the demographics found in DC proper, which is 46% Black or African American, 37% White, 11% Hispanic, and 4% Asian. Etiology of infantile spasms is presented in table one. In our cohort, 86% of patients had a known cause for developing infantile spasms. Brain MRI structural findings were the most common etiology across all groups. Structural findings were more common in Black or African American patients than white, Asian, or Hispanic patients. This was especially true for congenital lesions, such as malformation of cortical development, compared to acquired lesions, such as perinatal stroke or hypoxic ischemic events. The combination of both structural and genetic etiologies was also more common in Black or African American patients than in Hispanic patients. Infants with infantile spasms have better outcomes when treated early and if complete resolution is achieved. There are three first-line medications approved for the treatment of infantile spasms, and these include adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH, prednisone, and vigabatrin. The median time to treatment initiation in our cohort was three days, the range being zero to 21 days. This did not differ between groups. Overall resolution with initial treatment was achieved in 15 infants or 31% of our cohort. This is further broken down in table two. Among the 15 patients that achieved resolution, one patient was black or African-American, two were Asian, five were white and seven were Hispanic. 
Black or African American patients were usually initiated on prednisone. However, they were less likely to respond to initial treatment. This is one of the first reports of racial and ethnic disparity in infantile spasms. And further studies are needed for validation in other regions and to examine the causes for this disparity. These trends are currently being studied on a national level through the National Infantile Spasms Consortium and their publication is pending uh, at the time of this presentation. Driving factors we have considered include pandemic effects, insurance denials, family counseling, parent decline, trust in the healthcare system, social support, and provider bias. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share this important data on racial and ethnic disparity in infantile spasms. Uh, hello today to our nursing colleagues out there. Today, Shell and I are going to have the opportunity to talk to you about our Child and Adolescent Protection Center referral in the Mid-Atlantic United States before and during the COVID-19 pandemic study. Our study was spearheaded by uh, Dr. Simone Lawson, and our team included Teresa Bullen, myself, Shell Young Anderson, and Dr. Allison Jackson. The reason we decided to do this study is because we looked at our child abuse um, referrals, and we looked at the fact that all of a sudden our patients were now, or our children were now quarantined inside a house with a family, and people were spending a whole lot of time together in close proximity and not really going to schools or daycare, which made us kind of concerned about what was happening in those homes with all that together time. And so again, this quarantine and social distancing caused us uh, to want to investigate what was really happening in our own backyard. Now, to take this to another level, as many of you remember, in the media and different social media outlets during the pandemic, there was all these anecdotal stories of the increase in severity of child abuse cases at hospitals all across the country. So we wanted to take the opportunity to really look what was happening in our own backyards to see what the, what the pandemic, how it really affected uh, child abuse and what we were seeing here in the hospital. So our objective was to review the characteristics of cases referred to the Child and Adolescent Protection Center, or CAPC, both before and during the COVID-19 pandemic. So our study design was a retrospective chart review of referrals to CAPC. Um, we used from January 2015 to June 2020 um, to analyze our data. We used Pearson Chi-Square. Our comparison variables were patient demographics, injury type, concern for neglect, alleged perpetrator. And we also looked at hospital and PICU admission rates. Um, um, we used them as a marker for injury severity. So our results, um, we reviewed 15, 1,566 charts, um, 1,490. 1497 were from pre-COVID, post-COVID was 69 charts. Um, uh, we really didn't find any um, statistical significant, significant difference in our data um, pre-COVID versus uh, post-COVID. Um, so there were similarities um, pre and post-COVID to include the demographics and frequency of documented injuries. There was no differences pre and post COVID in the percentage of uh, neglect cases, injury type, or relationships of the alleged perpetrators to the victims. There was a decline in CPS referrals um, initiated by school personnel during the pandemic. Um, this makes sense um, because we know that um, a big portion of child maltreatment um, reports come from school personnel. Um, and also abusive injuries were not um, more severe during the COVID-19 pandemic based on hospital admission rates, need for critical care, or fatality of the cases. So in conclusion, there was no significant difference in the characteristic of cases reported to CAPC before and during the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
We did know a smaller proportion of child protection reports that came from school personnel, and this was likely the result of virtual learning. Um, there is a need for continued research to elucidate potential ongoing effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on child abuse and neglect cases. Thank you.